Hello and welcome once again to Life Off Screen. I'm Dan Rupel and I'm joined by my lovely wife, Peggy. We have a treat today. We're going to be joined by Corey and Vicki Edwards. Corey uh, began his career as stand-up comedian. He did that for many years. A lot of it paid the bills. It was also his joy and he was remarkably good at it. But then in 2006, he had the breakout film animated film, Hoodwink, which was always a family favorite. We loved it. We, in fact, we watched it again recently. It's really, really funny. Hold it that. still holds up. <laughs> but uh, now he has a, a new film. It's out on uh, Netflix called Fearless. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're going to talk about how he got that done. Yes, and you're going to meet his wife, Vicki. She's remarkable. She has IMDb creds herself as an actress. But what a champion. And they've got a whole story to tell about their pilgrimage. They even led them to Canada for three years. Three and years. what that looked like in getting a film done. So remarkable partnership. Uh, great unity in this couple. You're going to really enjoy their story. So let's just jump right in. Corey and Vicki Edwards. All the way from Dallas, Texas, yeah. Corey and Vicki Edwards. Hello, Hi, guys. Hey, you guys. Hey. Hello. It's <laughs> awesome. Here you are, unpacked, right? Are you unpacked? You just moved to Dallas? Sure. <laughs> as far as this screen is concerned, <laughs> we're totally unpacked from one of our many, many moves this year. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. You know, uh, Corey, I was, I was reading your, your, your background, and you almost could have put my name in your, your bio. Mm -hmm. uh, parents are from Ohio. Mm -hmm. uh, you early on would do, along with your siblings, you would do plays uh, in the in the neighborhood and invite uh, you know other kids in the neighborhood to be part of it. <laughs> you 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 were involved in sketch comedy, improv comedy. You're yep. early in your career, really, to put food on the table. You did stand up, <laughs> and uh, also you were heavily involved in in your church drama team and in in ministry. And there's so many parallels; it's kind of uncanny. Along that journey, was there a, a time when then maybe somebody championed you, encouraged you, or you just kind of realized that I can do this for a living? I can make a make a go of this. Uh, that's a good question. I think there are, are little moments along the way, and I think Vicky can answer this too, um, because we uh, we both kind of met each other at a stage where we were. Uh, uh, I think she was just finishing college, and I was I had my first job, and there was this this Venn diagram of a lot of things that we had both done growing up, as far as being in plays and and being uh, theatrical. Um, and I kind of knew her as a, a, a drama major. Um, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, when I first met her, and then uh, I was just coming out of I think uh, that that time where I wanted to be a filmmaker, but also uh, I kind of grew up performing, uh, like you say, like just putting on uh, sketches for the church because uh, my dad was a pastor, so we had a captive audience all the time. All these <laughs> yeah, and so great. I think that there were several. It's hard to. I'm trying to think of the one. I do remember in college I performed. Uh, mostly for free in college, doing stand-up. Mm -hmm. And then as I got out of college, uh, the activities director had me come back. And, uh, you know, <laughs> he asked me what I would charge. And I, I don't know what I said. Oh, a hundred dollars. <laughs> and he said, Corey, I think you're worth more than that. And I, and I Ooh, like, that's good. You have no perspective of the world of like, you, I've grown up with my parents and, and family friends saying, you're so wonderful, you're so talented, but, but it's somebody like that activities director or also my campus minister, uh, Don Collins, uh, when he saw me get up for chapel and do something funny that was kind of like for announcements, and he said, um, you have something people, other people don't, you need to pursue it. It's, it's oh, something that's, that's going to carry you the rest of your life. And so it means more, I think. I mean, my parents means the world to me of what they have given me as far as support. But it means the world when somebody that's a little more random and a little more outside, um, and, and those happened along the way. And I think that that's, you never realize what your words will do for someone else. And so I think about that when I, when I meet somebody mm -hmm. young and I say, um, you should pursue this, or maybe you shouldn't pursue this, you should pursue this. But definitely it puts, uh, there have been many times where I needed some wind in my sails and, and we've, mm -hmm. we've both been through those ups and downs. 
Yeah, those those words of affirmation or a champion early in, uh, man, they mean the world. They they, they are like you said, kind of the the wind beneath your your wings uh, to get going through the hard times. So. And uh, <laughs> early on, I can remember um, even when he would tour with Isaac Airfreight, and I think you actually were played at your church or something yeah. when you got to see them. It was we just there wasn't very many doing what we did. It was, uh, but um, if any, if any, <laughs> and so it was blazing a trail a bit, but yeah. I'm telling you, we've just visited 16 universities, film programs. Oh, are you being one of them? And, uh, the amount of people coming out, sketch comedy, animation, um, uh, all sorts of mm-hmm. things, the, 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 all the different opportunities have really yeah. blossomed. Yeah. Well, and to touch on that, I know we were talking before, a little before the show, but Isaac Air Freight coming through my town and coming through my church when I was in high school, it was an eye-opener to go, oh, wait a minute, you could do that for a job? Like, I, I think since I was 10 years old, I was like, I want to make movies. But there's so many other little splinter avenues of expressing yourself along the way of like, you can do sketch comedy. Um, there, there is a place for Saturday Night Live tone, even mm-hmm. in the church. And that's mm-hmm. that was... I think we've come a long way in 30 years, but like if I back up 30 years ago, that was still a little dangerous. That was still a little strange. It was. And as I did stand up comedy at many churches, it was so often it was, this is the first time we've had a comic here. So I hope you're good. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then afterwards they're relieved. Like, Oh my gosh, this was like a real comedy show. Like, because so often, yeah. Cause, Cause churches, when they experience theater or comedy or film, they're, they're like, sometimes I think Christians are relieved when it's like, oh, it was actually entertaining. It was, <laughs> yes. yeah. it was good. It was like a it real was good. thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, Vicki, um, here you are going to Tulsa uh, and your major was, was it performing arts? You no, know, I it- started out as a business major because my father was an entrepreneur and he sort of raised me that way. But I had a double minor in business, uh, in writing and business eventually because I changed to drama, television and film. So I realized that business was, while I had an acumen for it, it was not what I had a passion for. Mm -hmm. And I loved, loved being in the acting program at ORU. Yeah. Did you guys meet at ORU? Well, Corey had already graduated. So he had moved to Tulsa for a job. He went to school in Indiana. Mm -hmm. And I was still at ORU. But we met, well, I... (laughs) We have a real disagreement about when we met. (laughs) So I met Corey. Tell your version of when we met. <laughs> so my brother Wing uh, had a sketch comedy show on ORU's campus, Standing Room Only. Mark Steele, you know, was part of that. And um, Corey was part of that because Tony Leach and Corey knew each other from the production community in Tulsa. A, and, a later partner. Yeah. <laughs> and so the first time I saw Corey was in a Standing Room Only show, and he was, you know, he was... Ernie from Ernie and Bert. And I was like, oh, he's so cute. Was Ernie and Bert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we met after the show, but he doesn't remember that. You know, like after a show, there's like people coming up to you going, ah, it was funny. And you're like, hey, and you've yeah. kind of been like the oh, mode. That's mm-hmm. the, what I'm going to uh, use, as, your story. use as my excuse. Because, <laughs> because and it's my, uh, my recollection of meeting her is is uh, no uh, no less impactful. It was also at a, at a, a it was at a video shoot and uh, for my job and we had to shoot something. It was like some infomercial for word records. So it's like the logos flying through the sky and we have like different people of different walks of life looking up at word records. Or, it was one of those things that, you know, uh, you think this is my job today. Um, and I needed two, um, two college girls to come walking out of a building and look up at the logo. Just like, a, it's like a commercial shoot. And so a friend of a friend, uh, you know, said, I, I'll, I'll uh, recommend you two people. And Vicki was one of them. Lucky me. And when she walked Lucky down you. the stairs, it was like the music played. And I was like, thank you, God. How long can I keep her on the set? What can I do to get her on the set? So, I think you need another take. She was looking good. She was walking in slow motion. And like, so, so I feel bad that I don't remember. I love that she met me first as Ernie on stage singing Rubber Ducky, but, but uh, yeah, so we both have two totally different stories. Well, did he, did he woo you with his mad comedy skills? You know, we also joke, yes and no, we also joke that our first date should have been a disaster. I botched it, like I said, uh, <laughs> I wasn't gonna I, throw I said, you under the bus. I finally said, you, you wanna go out on Friday night? And she's like, yeah. And then I don't call her till like 
when did I call you? No, it was Thursday, Saturday. Friday afternoon? It was Saturday night, and he calls me at noon on Saturday. This so she'd already like, plan. forget this guy. This guy didn't plan ahead. He didn't tell me where we're going. So I call like hours before, and she was like, well, I didn't hear from you. So I have, what is it, desk duty? Yeah, it was an RA. So her hair is pulled back in a ponytail. She said, was not t-shirt. showed up at all. Yeah. No makeup. She's like, you know what? If he wants to take me out, this is her telling me this lady. If he wants to take me out, but fine. But this is it. I'm not, I'm not getting dolled up. So it was not a first date situation but at all. he was very smart because he took me to Garfield's, which they had uh, tablecloths that were paper, so you draw on them, and he's an amazing. Yeah. Person. Yeah. And, amazing. and that that is what made me go, okay, mm-hmm. okay, mm-hmm. maybe there's more here. <laughs> I love your story of seeing her in slow motion because yeah. Dan – Tells me, I will never forget the day you were in this white dress. This isn't the day we met. We actually met at a Christian concert at Knott's Berry Farm. Okay, so but. at church, this white dress with flowers in your hair, and you were coming down the stairs, and it was an ah moment for him. And I'm back telling lit, you, backlit, you know, I just. I have no white dress. So <laughs> I don't know who he was maybe, looking maybe at. Maybe it's another girl. I don't know, but I was impressed. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that I interesting? Thought it was me. That we fill in when we remember things. I mean, we're all getting older and older, and I, I, I think we kind of like, you know, you, you filter out the bad and you, you pump up the good, and, and yeah. there are things that we tell mm-hmm. each other. We're like, but was it that way? <laughs> I, I felt right. like it was a white That's why dress. We need each other. Yeah. <laughs> now, were you, were you already married before you guys moved to LA? Yes. 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 I was 22 and Corey was 25 when we got married. So we've been married 26 years. We actually got married the week before my graduation so that oh. all of my ORU friends could be there. Yeah. Now, the, the move to L.A., was it, was it really to pursue a, a career in film? Yeah. Or stand-up? Yeah. Or stand-up? Or? No, it was film. And, and, and stand-up was, it was kind of like out of college. I figured, oh, my gosh, people pay me to do this. So mm-hmm. it was a great way. Man, I mean, you know, it's like – what, what a great way to earn money and earn a yeah. living. So for a while, I was very happy to just go out and do that. But you're on the road a lot and, and like with a new marriage and all that. And, and honestly, mm-hmm. it wasn't my dream. So my dream was film. And uh, my brother and I started a company. You know, we we're just a few years married. And then uh, it's a whole other story. But um, I left my, my production company job. Uh, it was kind of like I wanted to leave and I kind of got asked to leave because I didn't a, want to be there anymore. It was a Jerry Maguire moment. Yeah, if you remember that. Yeah, manifesto. Yep. Yep. I, manifesto. manifesto. <laughs> I gave it to my boss. I'm like, let's do things differently. And he said, go do it. Um, so so um, my brother and a few other friends, uh, we started Blue Yonder Films. It was this new film company. And that honestly was, uh, those are some pretty lean, pretty hard years, you know, starting up a business on a production company. So as much as we had, uh, I had had success going out uh, doing stand up and, and still do it from time to time. It wasn't my dream. And we had had several, you know, avenues along the way of, we could have done this, we could have done that. But you know, mm-hmm. I, I, I will never be able to say enough how much Vicky kept saying that is that your dream though? Because yeah. you know, I, I don't want you going to a job and coming home and, and feeling like you missed out on your dream. And so, mm. uh, that that's just that overwhelms me every time I think about that's it. That's wonderful. Um, and and when it came time, we made a film that went to Sundance uh, in 1999. That was my brother's film that I produced. Yeah. That was the moment where we had made that in Tulsa, and we thought now is the time to move. So we had made a film, and we had some film prospects, and we had uh, clients that we were like shooting commercials and stuff. So it's like now's the time to go to LA. I think that was yeah. 2000. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. And so well, we couldn't afford to go. <laughs> no. So there are many leaps of faith in our life. And that was one where God provided we these weird knew ways. We were supposed to be there. Yeah. Um, yes. Yes. Not a question. And we actually had a job offer. We, Corey had a job offer in Houston. It was very lucrative and would have right. put him in charge of a whole television department. I mean, a small television department, but still creative directing. Mm-hmm. And we just felt like God was telling us, L.A. may be the way of struggle, but I will bless you either way, whether you go to L.A. or Houston. Oh, and we just felt compelled to L.A. I think part of that was Corey's you know, dream of filmmaking, but a lot of it was we saw it as a mission field and yeah. such a hurting industry yes. and really felt called there. But I remember those years of only knowing three months three to six months income in advance. Ugh. And we lived in that place for uh, 11, 10 to 15, 15 years, yeah, 15, 15 years. years. It was such a place of faith, but 
you, you know, you found, found him faithful. It was really remarkable. And, and Vicki, I, I love that, um, to champion, to be a cheerleader, because uh, that's what it takes. Because yeah. when you're, you're doing something that even buying our first house, trying to get a loan with his title being entertainment industry, you might as well say flake. Yeah. We had to put 25% uh, <laughs> down on the house. Just, it was crazy to, to get a small little nothing, but it's just the way it was. Um, but I want to talk about those early years because uh, um, I know that Dan met you early on. Maybe you connected at some point at the CCA or something. But my memory of meeting you, Corey, was when I got to help organize a pre-screening of Hoodwinked at Biola University. Yes. Uh, and we brought you in to rave reviews. I mean, standing O, they loved it. And I'm just going to let you know that from that moment, we became super fans. Wow. So much so. Yeah, we got to look at this. I don't know if I got the camera right on it. Oh, oh my goodness. Can you see we, that? We need to get over there and sign that. That's beautiful. <laughs> I bet you do. Okay. <laughs> well, how about that? How about, how about that? that? So, right? You put that up right before the call. Don't lie. Yeah. <laughs> so here, 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 do you have of all the guests? And you I got the, the, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> last, last week was Tim Hawkins. I had his poster up there. Um, that crazy. That, that's funny. No, the, uh, we actually watched it. We hadn't seen it for probably at least 10 years. And we watched it again last, last night. Last night. We were laughing. It holds up. It holds up. It's okay. still so funny. So I understand the CG animations come a long way, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. But since then, but it holds up the script and that cast. Yeah. That cast. Yeah. I know you have a harrowing process that you went through with that film. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, and Vicky always, you know. You know, I, I look at it now and I'm like, ah, oh, boy, some of it looks like 90s video game <laughs> scenery. Um, but then we, so we tried to pick a look that the goal was to make it almost look, we knew we didn't have a lot of money, so to, to look like almost like those old Rankin Bass, uh, Rudolph the red and Reindeer specials. If I yeah. had my way, it really would have been photographed like little stop motion puppets, like you could see the seams on the wolf's head. Mm -hmm. uh, the producers got a little nervous. So it's this weird kind of middle place of like, it, it sort of looks like, furry Shrek characters, and it sort of looks like little stop motion toys. But um, you talk about like, she, she had to watch it like 50 times because we went on this press tour. We went on an international press tour and then on a stateside one. And, and the reps were always trying to ship the wife off to go shopping. <laughs> Is that what most wives do? Like, I can care less. I would really like to watch the film. They're like, oh, I'm like, it's so funny. And I can't, I am not a repeat reader of a book, a repeat watcher of a movie. I could sit and watch that movie. Yeah, I did 50 times and laughed. Every, and it was so, I mean, I was just so proud of Corey and what they'd yeah. accomplished and hearing the audience communicating with his work was just a thrill. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're in a time now where I think you're like my latest project came out on Netflix and, and like we're at a time now where that's kind of the thing you do. And it's, we don't know when theaters are going to come back and I'm so happy to have anybody, you know, I, I'll have to imagine everybody at their homes watching it on their screens, but there's nothing like being in a theater yeah. And even, you know, whether you're a live performer or film, but mm -hmm. with film, it's like, I don't have to be the live performer anymore. I can sit in the back of the room and let the film perform yes. And so we would go, we would even buy like tickets to like <laughs> some random uh, strip mall theater or, you know, or just theaters around Los Angeles. We'd like, you want to go to Hoodwinked again? Yeah. And like, we'd do like a Saturday yeah. afternoon and just sit back there and listen it's to what, so fun. what jokes work, what jokes didn't, uh, hear some little kid yell it out <laughs> or hear two, or to see two really cynical, like college kids be like, <laughs> Like in the back laughing, like there's nothing. Or, and once it had been asked, high praise. Yeah. certain people say the lines with it, we were just shocked. We're like, they've seen it already. Like they it was know just, it. They can, know can it. And I tell you, at our house with our own kids, <laughs> I, it was standard to do this awkward <laughs> and then sidestep yeah. out of the frame. <laughs> it became a mantra. <laughs> yeah. the high praise when you can become a meme or you can become a quoted by kids uh, line from a movie. It's an independent project. And so we kind of did everything and, and it has a little bit of weirdness and roughness to it because of that. And I think you, you see a lot of artists, filmmakers or, or a, a, a band's first garage album where they didn't have a, there, there's some roughness and some energy yeah. to it that we tried everything. We tried the weirdest jokes. We have a Ken Burns joke in that movie. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah. like where the wolf recounts that he was raised by wolves. Like that's one joke. But then we said, let's actually go to a black and white photo with sad piano music and push in on baby wolves. And yes. like, that's weird. And I think the, the review from Entertainment Weekly was like, this these guys followed every flaky whim mm -hmm. and he gave it an A. So, yeah. that, so we're like, yeah. and, and most, since, of, most times those things get committed out of a project, yeah. you know, the producers weigh in and say. The longer we're yeah. in the business, the more I feel like that was rare. Yeah. And mm -hmm. unicorn. yeah, it is, it is. So, so I sh I'm as amazed as anybody that it's still, you know, there are a lot of movies that have come out since then that have like uh, funny animals and shenanigans in the forest. I mean, there's a lot of movies like this. So the fact that there are now like grown adults who say, I grew up watching your movie. I'm like, yeah. yeah. You know, you, you mentioned um, your, your latest on Netflix, Fearless. Um, to do that, to produce it, you moved your entire family to Canada, right? Yes. What was that experience yeah. like? That gets us to the crazy last two or three years of our life that I'm sure is the juicy part of this show. <laughs> um, it's just gonna, it, it, it put us on a, a crazy path because, and, and please jump in here, but but we we had been in LA for 20 years and we had been fortunate to to kind of, you know, go from project to project and, and, and stay alive in LA, but it was kind of like, a, you know, and, and then this opportunity came along, this, this group of LA producers but they said, we have a, a studio in Montreal. You'd have to move to Montreal. I mean, and it was only originally supposed to be for 18 months. Right. So we thought, what a fun adventure. Yeah. And so three years. <laughs> three years we were, later. We were there three, <laughs> three years. Oh, you and, you know, the, because they had a slate of four films. And so some of their films said, mine was the fourth film. So things were delayed on those films. I ended up helping with some of those films, punching up scripts or, or, or directing a scene that, that they had to add to one of their first films. So... Thank God I was paid while I was there, but it just got longer and longer. And the winters are very long there. And we were homeschooling our kids and we're like, how are, do we live here now? <laughs> um, so we just, I mean, it, it's been a year now, but we just came back from Montreal. It's been a year. And it's great to see the film come out, but but yeah. apart from the making the film, which is just this nutty film about superheroes and super powered babies and video games. Yeah. You know, it's a fun film, but like, that it's interesting when you when you go somewhere to make a project it it it, re, it kind of re-jump starts your whole life we have a whole chapter yes. now of our life that our our kids will never forget uh mostly good some bad uh mm -hmm. lots of kind of crazy struggles of living in montreal living a totally different way being mm -hmm. city people like i took the metro or my vespa scooter to work every day and we lived uh, in an apartment, which we've never really done by the... It was a really nice apartment. It by, wasn't like, like if you're picturing... Yeah, by a lovely little we canal. We suffering. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we were by an outdoor market. Yeah, so it was beautiful. You go yeah. to the market. You, so, yeah. Well, there were a lot of things we loved about Montreal, for sure. I think the hardest thing for me, and we talk about what it takes to sustain in this industry, and even as Christians... Um, it took about six months to find the church that we could plug into. And once we plugged in, well, part of that is that there are not a lot of Protestant churches in Montreal. It's mostly mm -hmm. Catholic because of the French-British conflict. Right. Yes. still happens. Um, and so any Protestant church is a startup, basically. The church we found was only two and a half years old. And Most of them were. We yeah. got to help build them and start a women's ministry uh, with them. And until that happened, it was very isolating. It was very, um, you think, oh, Canada is just like the U.S., but Quebec is obviously French Canada. And it's, it's not like there are huge differences, but there are micro differences that really start to affect you every day. I yeah. get asked all the time, like, you're so bubbly. Where are you from? <laughs> <laughs> American. American. I'm the American. Yeah. <laughs> when, when, we, when we used to, we, we didn't give to uh, Montreal, but we toured uh, like Vancouver and Edmonton and Alberta and Saskatchewan, you know, more of the West. Uh, but what we got is you Americans are so loud. <laughs> yeah. you're, you're so loud. <laughs> oh, and we took our kids to restaurants. People could not believe we would take our kids. They'd look at us like we were bringing dirty dogs into the restaurant. Really? And then really? once we were done that, we'd get, so 
we get all these compliments on how well behaved our children are. I'm like, you know why? Because we take them out with us. Yeah, yeah. So no, but I think they were afraid you're going to ruin my dining experience. And you know, yeah. I'm not sure. Speaking of your kids, um, as a homeschooling mom, wow. I mean, I have a I have a daughter and a daughter in law who are there. And um, was this something you? always had on your bucket list of this is what I want to do or did the situation of being traveling uh, with that with the best was that the best solution for your family I think it was a little bit of everything I think um, you know our oldest was diagnosed with some uh, sensory deprivation issues very young mm -hmm. and so we ended up finding a fantastic school in Los Angeles but even in preschool we were having discussions of whether we'd need to homeschool mm -hmm. so I think that was always sort and I've always loved teaching I mostly teach adults but I think my personality type I like to teach I, li I love information and I love sharing information <laughs> but I don't think we plan to homeschool in Montreal it was really a 180 decision that it was almost like it wasn't a dream well, but I woke up literally the day before school was supposed to start we'd enrolled them in a, in a certain academy a gifted academy and um, well, let's talk about that day because that yeah. that determined where we lived that determined everything about our three-year experience in Montreal. Yeah. So we had gone to the edge of the I island. I think we were trying to recreate our LA life in Montreal. So we we were mm -hmm. looking to rent a house in the suburbs. We had picked this school off island because it was you know looked perfect on paper. Right. And I remember we woke up in our our Airbnb, which we were in for like two weeks while we were trying to find a place. And she sits up and she goes, "What if we didn't do?" any of this <laughs> and I'm like what do you mean it's the day before school we bought the uniforms we bought all the supplies yeah yeah, yeah. we're enrolled at this school but it's going to be 40 minutes away from my job she and, but but we had taken this Airbnb right by where my job is right by downtown by this little canal and she's like what if we just found a place here and I'm like we can't find a place here we, I, when and she like looks, we had been looking for months for, for houses months. right yeah <laughs> What, like six hours later, she's like, let's go, let's walk down the block from our Airbnb and look at this apartment. Well, not only do we find an apartment, it's a ground floor on the nicest apartment building in the area. It was two apartments they had combined into one apartment. So it was like this super apartment so that like our dog and our kids could just run up and down the hallway. Yeah. So it, yeah. it felt big enough for our family. Yeah. And you know, when things are happening, as you say, you think, I, I, I guess we'll do this. And, and you feel like you got back into a corner or, no, but, this was a but total God when we, moment. when we get into times even now where we're like, is God in this? Are we going to get, yes. get out of this place we're in now? And we remember that apartment and that yes. day. And yeah. uh, homeschooling was hard, but I, I think that that apartment, that, that perfect place, there were days in the, in the dark kind of cold winters of Montreal yeah. or other times that we were just like, this is the most amazing place <laughs> that we live in. And I don't have to drive in the snow every day. <laughs> we have, we have parking. We have a pool across the hall. When our kids get nuts in the middle of winter, we can go over to the pool. Like wow. it, was, it was things we didn't even know we needed. And yeah. God just like kind of like, pushed us into this corner And it would have been day. very lonely if we had moved to the suburbs. I particularly wow. would have been incredibly lonely. It was just a God, it was God yes. totally intervening. And we mm -hmm. talk, you talk about how to survive this industry. We often talk about the stones of remembrance and mm -hmm. we journal about the times that God clearly intervened into our lives. And we journal them and say, mm -hmm. this is our altar that when we are confused, when it is silent, when there's been nothing for six months or longer in this case, like we can look back and say, God was faithful. God was trustworthy. And so I can relax because he has yeah. shown himself to be true. Mm -hmm. And having that history with God is what brings peace. Later in life, and our kids are pushing 40 now, they remember those things. It's like God was faithful to my parents back then. He can be uh, faithful to me now. Mm -hmm. So well, it's a lesson that stays with them the rest of their lives. And it charts courses, trajectories, things you wouldn't have considered otherwise. God is so amazing, his sovereign good hand. And to be able to point that out to your kids, to give them eyes to see is just so precious. And I, I want you to know that you encouraged me indirectly because I just yesterday passed on information on your Facebook page just about um, some really good ideas for virtual uh, field trips <laughs> and got huge thumbs up from them. So thank you for what you learned. You've passed on some good stuff to me as well. You referenced um, when you're in Montreal with your church getting involved in women's ministry and other things. And I know mm -hmm. both of you were very involved in the Bel Air Press drama 
group. Mm -hmm. And um, how important is it to be really connected to a faith, a family of faith, uh, when you're in this very uncertain, uh, you know, uh, industry? And if you don't have that community, not only holding you accountable, but supporting you, encouraging you, reminding you that God is faithful and good. I mean, it's vital. I don't know how anybody does this business, uh, uh, survives in this business for a long period of time without having something to go to. Like, like I am so glad I have her to come home to every day. And then I also am so glad I have a knowledge that there is a bigger thing than this industry. God is bigger than any of these. I mean, this last thing in Montreal we've been talking about, it was a hard project. Some days it were hard. Um, and then I think none of this matters because God is in control. God has a bigger picture than I do. I, and I, I can understand why there are people in this business that that have mental health issues and turn to drugs and yeah. turn to yes. wild behavior because if you put your value in the projects you make or the success or failure mm -hmm. of like mm -hmm. the arbitrary approval of a development executive who yes. he either had a great lunch or a bad lunch when he picked up your <laughs> yes. script. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's so arbitrary because I've seen talentless people rise to the top and I've seen super talented people just get buried for 20 years. So, so, you know, and, and there's a whole other discussion of when God says, you're ready, I'm going to put you in this place. But a lot of times, he, you know, the business is just the business. And, mm -hmm. and to have God to go to, you know, I, I don't know how you do it otherwise. It's, yeah. it's, you know, it I, is a tough business to break into. And having spent nine years working with undergrad film students as well to help them with their next steps into the industry. Because, I mean, how long did it take you for your first film? Let's see. Well, Hoodwinked. Let's see. Could I guess the second film. The yeah. Chillicothe was. Really well, I, the I first. produced Chillicothe. And, and so to direct my first film, what was that? 10, 15 years yeah, in the business. Yeah. That's right. 15 years. And honestly, I, we, we had like uh, about 10 years in Tulsa as a functional career as, as like shooting music videos, shooting commercials. Then we moved to LA and it was like ground zero starting over again. Mm -hmm. um, Cause it's all about networking. The clients didn't <laughs> follow right. us. Which is funny because when we were in, in Tulsa, we would lose clients because they'd be like, well, we're going with these guys from L.A. And we're like, hey, now we're the guys from L.A. And all our clients were like, eh, never mind. So, and then I think Montreal felt like another restart. And now we've come back, but we haven't come back to L.A. We've decided to do something different in Dallas. Mm -hmm. And it again feels like there's a lot of, I'm, of course, we're carrying a lot of clientele with us and a lot of experiences. Mm -hmm. But it's always this, kind of this restart. We've had so many restarts. And um, yeah, it's just... You, you have to have some, some greater, uh, higher-minded purpose that God yes. is carrying. Exactly. I know that's what you offer film students' advice. Begin to make stuff, no matter how yeah. old you are, because Todd, your brother, and Katie, your sister, yeah. in a way, you formed community at a very young age. I love that I finally figured out what to tell film students, because it's so <laughs> simple. Because everybody's story is different. They're, this is a career that is so serpentine and how you get there. And you might not get where you think you're going to go. And God is a big part mm -hmm. of that. Yeah. I, I, you know, mm -hmm. he will suddenly present an open door that you're like, I guess I'll walk through this door because I've got no other jobs. And it leads you for 10 years to something new. But um, yes. anyway, I, I never know what to tell film students when I get, came down to, you know, they'll be like, uh, should I get an agent? How do I get an agent? Uh, do I need a lawyer? Do I need to copyright my script? Do I need to blah, 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 blah. It's like, <laughs> just make stuff. Because if you keep making yep. stuff, if you write a short story, if you write a script, if you shoot a video on the weekend with your friends, that will just lead to making more stuff and making more stuff. And then an agent will go, uh, can I represent you? Or a lawyer will go, yes, I'll help you. Or people, mm -hmm. you'll put it on the internet or whatever. All that stuff that you're worried about, all those other steps. I, I see a lot of film students just like, just, just walking around trying to get an agent or walking around trying to get an opportunity. Mm -hmm. just, just look at what you have in your hands that you can make and make stuff. Because if you yeah. make stuff, people will notice. And then once you get an agent, he'll answer all those questions. Yes. Once That's you right. Or once, you, or, once you, or once you get into the film festival, there will be somebody there to answer all those questions. Once you, a distributor wants to distribute your thing, they'll answer all those questions that you keep asking me at these Q and A's because I don't know because I went down a distributor and an agent and a manager. Right. So, but, but the only things that moved us ahead in our lives are when we said, we got to just make it ourselves. 
Well, and it's not mm-hmm. just that people will notice, it's that colla- um, creative people collaborate. Yes. So when you start making things, you draw to you other creative yeah. people mm-hmm. and it's, it's just exponentially, you know, makes a creative environment and culture that networks to other people you didn't know, but they know, and you know people they needed. I mean, it's very, yeah. you know. You're more attracted to, you find your people, and yeah. you're more attracted to those people if you're like, well, I'm working on this clay animated thing every weekend, or well, I, I'm mm-hmm. shooting this thing for my friend who's in an improv troupe. Like, it just, you just and have to stick to each other. it's accountability to make you a better artist, because yes. you might think yeah. your script is awesome, and then you have your writer's group read it, and they're like, they're like, hello. I really need to work on dialogue. (laughs) And and, And there's uh, interpersonal skills that are so important in the collaborative process because you know, you've got to, you've got to learn to work with people and you got to do the give and take and you've got to get that chip off your, that creative genius chip off your shoulder. They used to come in freshmen, think they knew it all by seniors. They realized. Oh my God. And actually it was a healthier place to be in because they were teachable. Yeah. Yeah. You have to get it. I don't, I don't think there's a more collaborative industry there than, than making film. Uh, we really need, it does take a village to, to make a, a project. So you have to have your team that you trust. You're kind of all on the same page. You're, you're accountable to one another, but then you also need, as you guys have mentioned, your outside tribe. Those like, you know, that will call you on your stuff that will tell you this isn't good. Uh, that will be honest with you in, in real love and support. And that's what really undergirds everything we do. And also to have a real strong uh, marriage, family, mm-hmm. uh, where, where loved ones are just rooting you on. Well, um, we want to thank you so much for being with us. This has been a joy. The time has flown by. <laughs> and uh, we, just, we just wish the best for you with your, your current project, Fearless, and your new project. Is Doom it Doomstar? Star Janitorial. The janitorial. When's that coming out? Janitorial. Or you can just call it Doomstar. Yes. We're, we're very hopeful. It's in development right now. We're kind of locking up the funding, and uh, it's the next big thing, hopefully. Very good. It looks, it looks amazing. It was a pleasure. <laughs> oh, was, we love talking to you. The community. Yeah. <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much. Amen. Okay. We love you guys. This is great. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us for Life Off Screen with Dan and Peggy Ruppel. Life Off Screen is produced by Master Media International. Our technical director is Jason Rugg. Please subscribe to the Life Off Screen YouTube channel or subscribe to the Life Off Screen podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love to hear from you. You can leave your comments in the comment section. And to find out more about Master Media, go to mastermedia.com. Thanks again for joining us. Hope to see you next time.